Hello everyone, this is Jeff with Mississippi in the Civil War. Coming back to with you with Beneath Torn and Tattered Flags, A History of the 38th Mississippi Infantry CSA, Part 2. And if you haven't seen Part 1, I highly recommend that you go back and watch it first, as this will be a chronological history of the regiment from its earliest beginnings in 1862 through the end of the war in 1865. But just to sum up, in the last episode, we ended with uh, the 38th Mississippi participating in the Battle of Iuka, Mississippi in September 1862. The regiment uh, did not exactly cover itself with glory in that battle. Uh, in fact, to be frank, uh, the Colonel Fleming Adams ran from the battle, taking most of the regiment with him. So the 38th uh, was not, uh, not uh, very well received back in camp, I'm sure, by their brigade uh, regiments uh, that they were uh, serving with and so they had a lot to make up for and uh, when they finally made it into camp at Baldwin, Mississippi the 38th soldiers uh, would have had a chance to rest and reflect on their failure at the Battle of Iuka. These had to be painful and upsetting memories but uh, fortunately the fortunes of war were not going to give them much time to sit and brood events were already underway uh, that were going to put the regiment squarely into their second battle uh, at uh, Corinth, Mississippi, and it was going to afford the men of the regiment a chance to redeem themselves. So after his narrow escape at Iuka, Sterling Price realized that his army alone was not going to be powerful enough to defeat the Union forces in northeast Mississippi. So to accomplish uh, this goal, Price understood that he needed to unite his forces with those of the only other major Confederate uh, 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 army in Mississippi, the, the forces under Gen Major General Earl Van Dorn. Uh, Price contacted Van Dorn, who was already moving his small command of 5,000 men into North Mississippi, and the two generals agreed to unite their troops at Ripley, Mississippi. So Sterling Price put his army in motion on September 26th and his men completed the dusty march to Ripley on the morning of September 28th. So with the junction of the two armies complete at Ripley, Van Dorn, by virtue of his seniority, became overall commander of the combined force with Price his second in command. Van Dorn's army consisted of the divisions of Major General Mansfield Lovell, Dabney Morey, and Louis A. Bear, who had taken over from Henry Little's command after his death at the Battle of Iuka. In all, Van Dorn had a force of approximately 22,000 men to use against the Union Army in North, Northeast Mississippi. It didn't take Van Dorn very long to come up with a very ambitious plan for his army. He felt his best option uh, to prevent an attack on Vicksburg, which he, he believed was imminent, was to attack the Yankees in their staging area in West Tennessee. For this strategy to work, uh, the rebels first had to take the town of Corinth, Mississippi from the Federals. Uh, to, an advance into uh, Tennessee with uh, Federals uh, at his back in Corinth would have invited an attack uh, on his rear, and Van Dorn uh, did not want that. So before he could advance into Tennessee, he had to deal with the Yankees at Corinth. And although the rebel army at Ripley was only about 26 miles southwest of Corinth, the route they were going to have to take to get uh, into position to attack was going to be a nearly twice that distance. Starting at Ripley, Mississippi, the Van Dorn's hard-marching uh, rebel troops were going to move some 30 miles north to Pocahontas and uh, just over the state line into Tennessee. From there, they were going to wheel due east and advance approximately the eight miles to Chihuahua, Tennessee. And once there, they were going to follow the tracks of the Memphis and Charleston Railroad southeast nearly 10 miles until they reached Corinth, Mississippi. Now, the purpose of this convoluted march uh, was to put his men into position to assault the federal defenses northeast of the city. He chose to attack from this direction, knowing that the outer line of earthworks defending Corinth was weakest in this sector. And while Van Dorn was coming up with his plan of assault uh, for the town of Corinth, his counterpart, uh, General William Rosecrans, who was commanding the forces in Corinth, was working just as hard on a plan to defend the city. The Union General had 23,000 men in and around Corinth, 
and he kept them very busy every day with working on improvements to the existing fortifications that had built by the Confederates before they had been forced to pull out of the city. To make uh, his defenses uh, in Corinth even stronger, he ordered uh, his soldiers to build an inner line of earthwork forts along the northern and western approaches to Corinth. When completed, there were seven forts stretched in an arc around the city, connected e to each other by a line of trenches. The name of these strongholds were batteries Robinette, Williams, Phillips, Tanrath, Lothrop, Powell, and last but not least, Madison. Fully manned with infantry and, uh, and uh, with cannon, the inner line of defense was very strong and it would exact a very heavy toll from an attacker as the Confederates, and in particular uh, for our story today, the 38th Mississippi, were about to find out the hard way. The Corinth campaign begins on September 30th, 1862, when Van Dorn's rebels begin the long march north to Pocahontas. Uh, they arrive in the town on October 1st. The Gray Column then turned east and headed for Chihuahua, Tennessee, and entered that town on the evening of October 2nd. At 4 a.m. on the morning of October 3rd, uh, the weary men of the 38th Mississippi were roused from their bedrolls to begin the final leg of the journey from Chihuahua, Tennessee to Corinth, Mississippi. Van Dorn sets a very fast pace in this march, uh, pushing his men to reach the town before federal reinforcements could arrive. This was a very difficult march for the Confederates. Uh, the temperatures were high, uh, there was a lack of good water on the, mar uh, the march route, and uh, a lot of Confederates wrote about uh, uh, how just how difficult this march was. James Newton Carlisle Sr. of the 37th Mississippi Infantry, which was brigaded with the 38th, uh, wrote in his journal, through the driest section of the cotton states we endured the worst of distresses, thirst. What is comparable to this burning, parching fever? Lack of bread is sweet in comparison. So heat exhaustion uh, from lack of water and, and from the, just the, the heat uh, t took a terrible toll on the men of the 38th Mississippi. The roadside was soon littered with dropouts from the regiment uh, who were just unable to uh, keep pace with the, uh, with the rapid march that Van Dorn was making. Uh, not all of the men dropped out because of heat though. Uh, some uh, didn't want to fight in another battle and uh, stole away when they could. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Preston Brent of the 38th wrote a letter home to his wife Frances and he uh, made plain why some of these men uh, deserted. He wrote uh, to her, The morning that I left camp to go into the fight, I made a report of the effective strength of my regiment. It was 314 all told. But when I arrived at the battlefield, I found that number of the regiment was only 150 strong. This was owing a great deal to the fatiguing march that we had to make the morning of the battle and a great deal to the cowardice of some of the men that never had any fight in them or ever will. I have heard from the most of them and that they were on their way home. No doubt they will tell great tales of what they have seen and what they have gone through with. Poor cowardly devils, they have done, uh, not done anything but couch themselves up in some hospital or tent and frame themselves sick studying up the whole while to devise some plan to get home, but finding it impossible to get a proper furlough, they openly desert both from hospital and regiment claiming to be badly mistreated. I hope the citizens will treat them with perfect contempt and as far as possible annoy them so that they will have to return to their command. So yes, the 38th Mississippi um, was raised at a time when the draft was starting. So they got a lot of men signed, that signed up to avoid the draft that, uh, let's say their, their commitment to the Confederate cause was probably uh, less than uh, stellar. And uh, a lot of these men would desert whenever and wherever they could. So that was a constant problem uh, for the regiment was desertion. So when the Confederates form up for the attack on uh, Corinth, um, 
About 9 a.m. on October 3rd, uh, the regiment halted at a point approximately one and a half miles from the outer line of Federal Works. Van Doren then began to deploy his army for the assault, ordering General Lovell to form a line of battle to the right of the Memphis and Charleston Railroad, with General Price to form his two divisions between the Memphis and Charleston and the Mobile and Ohio Railroads. In positioning his men, Price ordered Maury's division to the right, Hebert's division to the left, and Green's brigade on the right. No, Green's brigade on the left, and Martin's brigade in the center, and Gates' brigade on the right, leaving his old brigade, now commanded by Colonel uh, W. Bruce Colbert, in reserve. To oppose this initial Confederate assault, Rosecrans massed along the outer works about 15,000 men. The Union soldiers had to spread themselves very thin to cover this uh, outer line of fortifications, and they were outnumbered by the concentrated rebel army. But Rosecrans did not intend for his army to uh, uh, fight and die in these outer, outer works. He planned for them uh, to just fight a delaying action, force the Confederates to uh, position themselves for the attack and, and give away their dispositions, and then he would uh, pull them back into the inner works that were much stronger. So by 10 a.m., all of the Federal skirmishers had been forced back into their earthworks and the rebels would begin their main attack. At 11 o'clock, Price gave the order for the advance and the 38th Mississippi marched forward with their brigade. They moved towards a gap in the Union line between the 81st Ohio Infantry and the 12th Illinois Infantry that was protected by a two-gun detachment of the 1st Missouri Artillery U.S. And, the, and these Union uh, cannoneers were going to make the rebel charge a very costly one as they just pumped round after round into the charging Mississippians. Major George H. Stone of the 1st Missouri Artillery later wrote with pride how his artillerymen met this assault. And he said, Lieutenant Conant's section stationed near our center was literally mowing the rebels down. But with a determination worthy of a better cause, the enemy still pressed on and near the entrenchments. The infantry supporting Lieutenant Conant's section, 81st Ohio and the 12th Illinois, were driven back, the artillery horses nearly all shot, and the cannoneers compelled to retire, leaving their guns. The defense of this section could not have been better, Captain Welker being there in person and the last one to leave his guns when all hope of saving them was gone. And after the battle, uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Preston Brent of the 38th wrote a very detailed letter to his wife and he explained uh, how this fight for the cannons went. He told her, I stated that I succeeded in getting some 150 men drawn up in line on Friday, occupying the right of the brigade, a post of great honor. While I was getting my regiment in line of battle and posting the guides, the enemy fired a shell at me which passed within two or three feet of my head and struck a tree about ten feet from the regiment but did no damage. I then ordered the men to face down upon the ground which they did with great promptitude. In this position we remained for some thirty minutes, receiving the heaviest cannonade that the mind could imagine. The enemy having gotten the exact position of my regiment began to throw their shells immediately in our ranks killing some and wounding a great many. We were therefore unable to remain in this position any longer, so we were ordered to charge to protect ourselves from such a deadly fire. We did so, and in a short time we had the enemy driven from their works and their guns in our hands. We did this in a short time, but nevertheless we lost a, a great many men in this charge, for we did not fire a gun until we were within 40 paces of their works. The reason of this was that they had fallen a great amount of timber in front of their works and we were busily climbing over treetops, but when we cleared the treetops we made the Yankees pay for it. My regiment in this charge captured two fine pieces of artillery, a parrot, and a rifled brass piece. We also taken several prisoners in this charge. After taking the breastwork and driving the enemy from it, 
Our men were so scattered that we were compelled to reform our lines again, which we did in a short time, and then pressed on after the enemy, driving them within Corinth. This ended the first day's fight. So the initial attack had, had gone very well for the Confederates. The outer defenses had been overrun. The Yankees were forced back into their inner fortifications. And it was at this point that the rebel attack stalled uh, due to uh, uh, using up all of their ready ammunition and just sheer exhaustion from, from uh, hours of fighting in the intense Mississippi heat. And as darkness crept over the battlefield, uh, the musketry and cannon fire grow, slowly faded away uh, and the, 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 bl the battle ended for the day. Uh, the 38th Mississippi had done very well uh, this first day of the Battle of Corinth but the success came at a very high price. Uh, one of the first to fall was the regiment's brigade commander, uh, Colonel Martin. Uh, he had been leading the charge on the outer works. Uh, he was hit by a shell fragment and mortally wounded. In his report on the battle, General Price uh, eulogized Martin saying, the gallant bearing of this officer upon uh, the bloody field and won for him a place in the heart of every Mississippian. In the 38th Mississippi, uh, Major Walter L. Kern was also wounded in the charge, hit in the right hand by a bullet while he was waving his sword over his head trying to urge the men forward. And uh, this was going to prove to be a career-ending wound for uh, Major Kern. He was uh, not going to be able to return to the regiment and he was never really going to regain use of his hand. So after dark, Martin's brigade uh, now led by Colonel Robert McLean of the 37th Mississippi Infantry, was moved to a position along the Mobile and Ohio Railroad, very close to the Union lines. Uh, the exhausted soldiers dropped their bedrolls behind the embankment, but I'm sure their, their sleep was disturbed by the sounds of uh, uh, spades and shovels as the Federals worked furiously through the night to strengthen their earthworks uh, before the next day's attack. So even though he had not won a decisive victory on the first day, Earl Van Dorn still believed that he could uh, gain a victory at Corinth. And thus, he drew up plans uh, to continue the attack on October 4th. The strategy he devised was going to put the 38th Mississippi and their brigade into the thick of the fighting on, uh, on the second day's battle. This fight called for Hebert's division to lead off the advance uh, to the inner Union works and thus bear the brunt of the early fighting. Hebert was ordered to advance with his division at first light against the Yankee right and once engaged, Maury's division would strike the center and then uh, the Lovell's division would attack the left. And unfortunately for the rebel soldiers, who had to carry it out, uh, Van Dorn's plan went awry almost from the very beginning. Uh, General Hebert, who was supposed to start the fight uh, by attacking the, the federal right, uh, uh, declared himself sick and was relieved of duty by General Price. Command of the division passed to General Martin Green, and in the confusion which followed, precious time was lost. When Green took over, he found the division on the west side of the Mobile and Ohio Railroad, and he prepared them to attack by placing his brigades in the following order from left to right. The 2nd Brigade of Colonel Colbert, the 4th Brigade of Colonel McLean, the 1st Brigade of Colonel Gates, and then the 3rd Brigade of Colonel Moore. At 10 a.m. Green gave the order to attack and the long gray line began a slow wheel or turn to the south. In this maneuver the division swung just like a gate with the 3rd Brigade the hinge and the 2nd Brigade at the outer edge of the gate with the other brigades in between. Uh, once they had completed the turn and were facing south towards Corinth, the rebels marched straight for the, the Yankee entrenchments. And during this uh, wheeling movement, the 38th Mississippi was in the brigade that was toward the outside of the formation. Consequently, these men had to march a much longer distance and move much faster than the regiments posted on the inside of the wheel. Thus the regiments belonging to Gates and Moore's brigade struck the Union line first, overrunning Battery Powell and threatening to cut the Union army in two. Colbert's and McLean's brigades were slowed by the rough terrain they had to pass through, but by 10.30 a.m. they had finally broken into an open field about 400 yards east of Battery Powell. 
As soon as they were in the open, however, the rebels were hit uh, by massed federal fire and their advance stopped in its tracks. They were hit by the, the, the Union infantry and artillery of, of Brigadier General Napoleon Buford's Federal Brigade. So for nearly 45 minutes, the men of the 38th Mississippi loaded and fired their muskets as fast as they could, trading volley after volley with the Yankees to their front. They kept up a withering fire until their brigade commander, Colonel McLean, uh, had his leg taken off by a well-aimed shot uh, from a federal cannon. At this point, the brigade, uh, under heavy fire and uh, suffering uh, very high casualties and beginning to run out of ammunition, began a quick retreat along with Colbert's brigade. Uh, Gates and Moore's brigades didn't fare much better. After taking Battery Powell, they were subjected to a terrible crossfire and unable to advance any further, they had to retreat and give up the fort that they had uh, won at, at such high cost. Elsewhere on the field, Van, Torn, Van Dorn was having the same kind of luck with his other two divisions. Uh, Maury's uh, attack was boldly repulsed with heavy losses in the attack on Battery Robinette, and uh, unfortunately, General Lovell did not attack with his division at all. So, having failed to take Corinth by storm, uh, Van Dorn realized he had no choice but to order a retreat and try and get his army safely away from Corinth. To escape, uh, the re rebels had to retrace the route they had taken to Corinth. The weary sword soldiers plodded into Chihuahua, Tennessee after dark on October 4th and made camp for the night. Uh, the next morning, the Gray Column marched west, barely avoiding disaster when they found federal troops blocking their escape route over the Hatchie River Bridge. Fortunately, uh, Van Dorn found another crossing of the river, and the Federals uh, were not able to cut off the rebels who continued their march to Ripley, where the campaign ingloriously ended. Uh, the 38th Mississippi in this fight uh, suffered very high casualties. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Brent uh, probably mirrored the feelings of many of his men when he told his wife in a letter, uh, I will sum up by saying that we had to fight for three days in succession to get out of the trap old Van Dorn got us in. And uh, for Brent, the end of the campaign also meant uh, a very unpleasant duty. He had to write uh, to the next of kin of his men and uh, tell them the sad news of their relatives passing. And in fact, he started this process in the letter to his wife. He told her, quote, tell Mrs. Walker that Cicero Walker is either killed or taken prisoner. I cannot say which. He was last seen on Saturday, the second day of the fight, on top of the enemy's breastworks in company with Lieutenant J.W. Ball, both of whom have not been heard of since. You can tell her that we've sent some of our men back to bury the dead and that they will be, be here in a few days, and I can probably give her some more information about him. My old company, under the command of J.C. Williams, went into the engagement with 18 or 20 men. We had four killed and some four or five wounded. I will have a short, in a short time a list of the killed and wounded of my regiment made out and published for the benefit of the citizens. And when the casualty list was finally made out, uh, the 38th Mississippi, which only took 150 men into the Battle of Corinth, had a casualty list of nine killed, 25 wounded, two missing, and 35 captured, which is terrible losses given the small size of the regiment. And the Battle of Corinth had been a bloody defeat for the Confederacy, but I think for the 38th it was kind of a moral victory. After the, the terrible showing they had made at Iuka, uh, they, had, they had fought very well at Corinth uh, despite their small numbers. Uh, they had re redeemed themselves and kind of redeemed the name of the regiment. In fact, uh, a newspaper article saved by the family of Colonel Preston Brent really expressed the importance that the regiment attached to the Battle of Corinth. And this the article said, It will be remembered that the 38th Mississippi Regiment achieved an unenviable notoriety in Iuka. Being a new regiment and the engagement in Iuka being their first, it was placed in, it did not stand the severe crossfire. But in the Battle of Corinth, it blotted out every stain that may have been attached to it by the Iuka affair and fought gallantly hand-to-hand -hand with the oldest veterans in the service. The regiment now stands forth, marked for its struggle in Cor the Corinth fight, and came out uh, the proudest of the proud. So the 38th Mississippi went into the Battle of Corinth, a small regiment, came out an even smaller regiment, 
but those sur survivors uh, that were still there were now uh, veterans. They had been toughened by the, the rigors of war. And during the winter of 1862-1863, as the regiment recruited and built up its strength, these men would teach uh, the lessons they had learned to the new recruits that the regiment was receiving and that they had learned at such high cost. And uh, these men were going to need to learn these lessons because they had even tougher battles ahead of them. And we will be learning about those tougher battles uh, in the next episode. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this, this uh, uh, episode of uh, the Regimental History of the 38th Mississippi. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up. If you have not uh, subscribed to the channel, please do. It really helps me to gauge how much interest there is in, in doing this sort of content. But uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, Beneath Torn and Tattered Flags Part 2. And I will be back very shortly with Part 3. But uh, have a very good evening, and I hope to see you again soon.